Hey, welcome back everyone to the winter semester with the ECHT seminars. Uh, we'll have two talks today separated by half hour coffee break. Feel free to stick around in between. We'll make some breakout rooms. People can hang out and chat uh, during that break. A um, couple things, feel free to raise your hand. If you have a question or comment, feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to type something into the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat. I'll be watching for hands or you just unmute yourself and just shout it out and you're welcome to do that as well okay we're all pretty good at interacting uh, on zoom these days and so hopefully things will run smoothly okay so it is my pleasure to introduce Bert Guyou who will be telling us about our motivic and c2 equivariant v1 self maps all right thanks very much uh yeah so i'm so thanks for the invitation to to speak uh, I think, you know, Dan has sort of pioneered the, the, the Zoom conferences. I mean, he started this years ago, but I'm now sort of everyone's doing it, but uh, we're sort of pros by now, so that's great. Um, okay, so yeah, I want to talk about these uh, V1 self maps and the, these sort of new contexts of the motivic and equivariant categories. Uh, and so this is joint work with Prasit Bhattacharya and Ang Lee. Um, and so, by the way, they are both uh, on the job market this year. And so, if you are, if your department is fortunate enough to be hiring, uh, and you have not given their applications full consideration, I would encourage you to do so. Um, all right. So, yeah. So, I'm going to be talking about these self maps, and along the way, we'll also encounter other questions, in particular questions of of realizing modules. Uh, and these will be modules over the Steenard algebra uh, and these sort of new contexts. But let's get started. So I'll start with some uh, review of some background material. So sort of quick uh, rush through uh, chromatic homotopy theory. So recall that there are such things called Morava K theory. Um, and so implicitly there's a prime that's fixed here. Uh, today, P will be two. Um, and uh, so for each N, for each tight N, there's, there's a Morava K theory and uh, it has homotopy, which is periodic with a periodicity operator uh, known as VN. And once you have these Morava K theories, this allows you to define the notion of type of a finite spectrum. And so we say it's type N if, well, if the first uh, Morava K theories up to Kn minus one vanish, uh, but the nth Morava K theory is non-trivial. Okay. Uh, and so then we can talk about the, the subcategory, I'm um, calling it Cn. This is the subcategory of spectra, which are of type at least N. Uh, in other words, these are the Kn minus one acyclics. Uh, and then these are nested in such a way. And in fact, Hopkins and Smith uh, showed that these are all of the so-called thick subcategories of the category of uh, p-local finite spectra. So that's an important sort of organizational result. Uh, another important theorem there um, of Hopkins and Smith is that, well, if you have a spectrum which is type N in this sense, then it admits what's known as a VN self map. Um, and so that's the, the V1 self maps that are the subject of this talk. And so VN self map means that, well, on the nth Morava K, K theory, and so again, that's the first one that's non trivial, there we have an isomorphism. And on the other Morava K theories, uh, it's no potent. Now remember, the lower Morava K theories are already zero, so that's not much of a statement there. But the, the higher ones are necessarily non trivial, and so there the requirement that it's no potent um, is, is, is certainly uh, powerful. Okay, uh, so like I said, today we're gonna to be focused on P equals two, and moreover, we're gonna be focused on N less than or equal to one. So N is gonna be either zero or two today. Uh, and so K is zero, well, that's just rational homology. Um, and K of one, well, if we're at P equals two, then that's KU mod two. So periodic complex K theory, where we've, uh, we're taking the cofiber of two on that. And so if we're looking for V0 self maps, um, well, we can look at the degree two map on the sphere. So the sphere is type zero because it has non-trivial rational homology and degree two map is a v V0 self map. And one thing that's good to do with these self maps is when you look at the cofiber, it gives you a complex of, of uh, one higher type. So here the cofiber of two, in other words, the Morse spectrum is then a type one complex. I think Dylan's going to be talking about red shift later. And that, so here we have something that's going up in chromatic height from zero to one. That's an example of so-called red shift. Okay, well, by the Hopkins-Smith theorem, this is a type one complex. And so it should admit a V1 self map. Uh, and sure enough, Adams had showed previously, this was uh, back in his J of X4 paper, he showed that the Moore spectrum does admit a V1 self map. 
And so here I'm calling it v1 to the fourth. Uh, so that four is referred to the periodicity. And so what that means is that, well, if we apply uh, complex K theory, this map is inducing multiplication by the fourth power of the bot element, okay? So that's V1 to the fourth. So V1 is the bot periodicity element in complex K theory. Okay, great. Um, but you know, typically when you're looking for these, these finite complexes with, with a fixed type and, and these self maps, um, it's good if you can find a self map with, with a low periodicity. Now four is already pretty low, so that, that's, that's great, but can we do any better? And so sure enough, uh, Davis and Mahold considered the spectrum Y and it's, we, we get it by taking the cofiber of two and the cofiber of eta and smashing them together. Now that's again, a type one complex. It's a little bit bigger, it has four cells instead of two, but it turns out that that uh, slightly larger complex then has a V1 self map of lower periodicity. Okay, so here the periodicity is one. So this is a map from the second suspension of Y to itself, uh, which uh, again induces multiplication by the bot element in complex K theory. And so as I was saying before, when you take the cofiber, this is then going to be a type two complex. It's gonna have higher type by one. Uh, the cofiber here, I'm calling it A of one. And so that A of one is, is a reference to something about the Steenrod module structure, okay? And so the next thing I wanna do is uh, just remind you about Steenrod algebra and Steenrod modules, uh, and the things that are gonna be coming up later in the talk when we go to the motivic and equivariant contexts. Okay, so first, uh, just fixing notation. So A for us will be the mod to Steenrod algebra. Uh, recall that this is an algebra uh, generated by operations known as square one, square two, square four, square eight, et cetera. And this is the endomorphisms of the uh, eilenberg maclean spectrum, uh, mod two coefficients. Uh, and as such, if you take the cohomology of any spectrum X, and so here cohomology means mod two cohomology, uh, then automatically that acquires the structure of an A module, right? It's a module over the Steenrod algebra. And so here's a couple of examples. Uh, so first we have M, the Mohr spectrum. So that has two cells uh, and here they're placed in degrees zero and one. Uh, and then this black line here is gonna be a square one. Okay, so I'm gonna use this convention in the talk today that a black line is gonna be an action by a square one. Um, now M, you, you can think of it if you like as the suspension spectrum of RP2. Uh, and so then in RP2, we, we have the cohomology class in degree one and two, which are connected by a square one, okay? Similarly, if we look at S mod eta, well, you can think of that as a suspension spectrum of CP2, and that, um, you know, it's gonna have cells, uh, you know, degree two and four, if you like, or, or zero and two, depending on how you index things. And those two cells are connected by a square two in cohomology. So the, the blue curved line is a square two whereas the black line is a square one. Okay, and by the way, the, the fact that these have such nice attractive uh, A module structures where you just have the sort of the single operation, this is really corresponding to the fact that the maps that we've coned off, right, in, namely two and eta, these are the Hopf invariant one elements or rather the first two Hopf invariant one elements. That's corresponding to the simple uh, A module structure. Okay, and then we have the spectrum Y, which we get by smashing these two modules, uh, spectra together rather. And then, so the Kunis uh, theorem gives you that you can just tensor the modules together. Uh, and so this is the structure that you get there, okay? And we're gonna refer to this A module as B of one. It'll come up again later. All right. Another uh, character that we need in this story is the subalgebra A of one of the Steenard algebra. So remember, I, I reminded you that A is generated by the squaring operation, square one, square two, et cetera. Well, if you stop yourself at just square two, so you, you just take the first two, uh, it turns out this generates a finite subalgebra. It's an eight dimensional subalgebra. And this is what it looks like. Um, I guess, you know, there's also an A of zero, uh, I might have said. Uh, so A of zero, uh, and that would be uh, just those dots. Uh, so that's just, if you only take square one, but if you allow square two as well, then you get this larger subalgebra, okay? Um, and so again, in this picture, so each dot is, is a copy of F2, uh, each line, so the black vertical lines are square one, the curved blue lines are square two. Uh, and uh, you know, when you have a line that's indicating a left multiplication by the appropriate element, okay? 
maybe I'll mention uh, that you know, in, in the, you know, you, you see some, some relations in this picture. If you focus on this part, it tells you that, okay, if I do square two and then another square two, that's the same as square one, square two, square one, right? So this is one of the so-called Adam relations and there are many more involving higher squares, but just the, the first case that you see in this picture. Um, all right. So one thing that you might wonder about, so remember I, I told you that a cohomology of spectra are always A modules. You know, this looks like, you know, some finite object and we might wonder, um, is this the cohomology of some spectrum? Um, well, it's not really a well-posed question at this point because, um, you know, a cohomology of a spectrum is gonna have not just a, an action of A1, it's gonna be a full A module, right? So really to ask that question, we would wanna extend this to a full A module structure. In this case, all that really means is we would need to specify, well, what's a square four action? Okay, because it turns out there's no room for the higher operations. Okay, so square four, well, you can see that there's really just these three cells where I could possibly operate non-trivially, right, degrees zero, one, and two. Um, and it turns out that the ADEM relations dictate that necessarily there is a square four on that degree one cell. Okay, that's, that's forced by the ADEM relations, it turns out. Uh, however, the ADEM relations do not say anything about square zero, uh, about the de degree zero or degree two cells. And so it turns out that those are valid A modules, whether or not you put square fours on, on those two. Okay, and so that gives you four different A module structures uh, that you can get. Okay, uh, and it turns out that all four of those uh, can be realized as the cohomology of a spectrum. Um, okay, so then I just want to say a little bit about one way to think about that V1 self map on the spectrum Y, one thing you can do is first realize that you have an extension of A modules right, involving this A1 and the B1. So remember B1 was the A module coming from your spectrum Y. And actually it doesn't matter which of the four A module structures you choose on A1, for any of those you can write down an algebraic extension here. Okay. Well, an algebraic extension gives you an element of X, okay? And as uh, topologists, we like X over the standard algebra because, well, that's the input for the Adams spectral sequence. Okay, so we have some element of X and then we can ask, oh, does this element survive the Adams spectral sequence to give us uh, a self map of Y? Okay, and then you can show that in this case, sure enough, it does. Uh, basically, you can just show that the you know, where uh, Adams differentials on this class might land, it turns out all those groups are zero. And so there's just no possibility for a differential. Here. Okay, so so far I've sort of argued for why um, you have a map. I haven't really convinced you that this is a V1 self map. And so really you would need to do more work to check that that map we've produced is a V1 map. And one way to think about it is look at the cofiber and, and use some Margolis homology uh, arguments to, to see what happens there. But um, I'm not going to talk more about that right now. Okay, so this is my review of sort of the classical story. And now we're gonna turn to the motivic and echo variant context. Any questions at this point? Okay, so if you've uh, seen me give a talk in the last five years, there's a good chance that you've seen me draw this particular diagram. I, I really like it. Um, so what's going on in this diagram? Um, so down here we have the category of spectra, the stable homotopy category. And the bottom left, we have the C2 equivariant stable homotopy category. Um, and then up top, we have these motivic categories, right? And so there's the C motivic category, there's the R motivic category. And then we have uh, various functors relating them. Um, so down here, we have the, the underlying functor. So if you have an equivariant spectrum, you can just consider the underlying spectrum. And that's what that functor U is doing. Um, up top, we have an extension of scalars functor going from varieties over R to varieties over C, and then this extends to a functor on the motivic stable categories. And then the, the vertical functor is a complex Betty realization. And so again, on sort of under, at a level of spaces, this would take sort of complex uh, variety and, and you know, give the underlying complex manifold as a space. Okay, um, all right. And it turns out if you apply this functor to an R motivic space, then the complex points acquire C2 action by complex conjugation. And so that's why that, you know, this lands in equivariant spectra. 
There's another uh, functor that's related or that's gonna be coming up today. And that's the geometric fixed points functor. Um, and you know, I'll say if, if you're not super familiar with, with all the different constructions for echovariant spectra, you know, there are several different fixed point functors for echovariant spectra. The geometric fixed points one is sort of the one you might have guessed if you didn't know uh, about all the technical details of, of echovariant spectra, right? It's the one that sort of uh, behaves as fixed points do at the underlying, at the space level, okay? So in some sense, it's the, it's the easiest to, to, to think about. Um, okay, now it, it doesn't make the diagram commute, but it is another functor there that's, that's relevant. Now, earlier I was reminding you about the, the sort of the thick subcategories in the classical situation. Um, these have been studied in the motivic context, uh, although you know, the story is not completely understood and people are still thinking about this. So some people that have worked on this are Wakimi, uh, Heller Ormsby, and there's a very recent paper of, of, of Stan uh, from just a few days ago, uh, talking about uh, thick subcategories in the motivic context. On the other hand, in the equivariant context, uh, the things are better understood. Um, and so I, I believe the first person to, to make uh, good progress on this was Neil Strickland. And then there's the much more recent work of Balmer and Sanders on the equivariant uh, category. And so I'm gonna say a little bit about that uh, in a minute. Maybe first, just one comment of philosophy. So, uh, you know, this is really a point of view that, that I have liked and uh, that's been developed in recent years is that, you know, if, if you're trying to understand or do calculations in the equivariant world, um, often it turns out to be fruitful, especially if there's an object in the equivariant world, which, which comes from the motivic world, the R-motivic world, often it's fru fruitful to think about the computation in the R-motivic world. That tends to be a simpler computation to do. And then you can sort of push down to equivariant and, and, and learn something there. Okay. So, right, let me remind you about the, you know, the, the discussion of thick subcategories in the equivariant world. So again, this is just the, the notation that we had before for the classical, right? So CN was our subcategory of type uh, at least N spectra. And now we had our two functors, U and phi from equivariant spectra down to ordinary spectra. And basically we can just pull back our category CN. You think of this as pulling back an ideal uh, to our equivariant category. Okay, so on the one hand we have U inverse CN. And so that's the category of equivariant spectra whose underlying type is at least N. Uh, but we also have the phi inverse CN, and so that's the equivariant category whose fixed points, remember this is the geometric fixed points, and we ask those be at least N. And those are certainly different categories. Um, and it turns out that these are the, are the, the thick subcategories in the equivariant context. Um, one uh, result that's related, it's going to come up uh, a little bit later, um, in the Balmer Sanders paper is that suppose you have an equivariant spectrum whose underlying type is at least N, then it turns out that necessarily the geometric fixed points have a type at least N minus one. So the type of the fixed points is allowed to drop, but drops by at most one. Um, you know, in terms of that, that, that shift terminology, you could think of this as a blue shift by one if it drops by one, um, but often it'll in fact increase. Okay, uh, and so anyways, this leads to our definition of the type of an equivariant spectrum. So we're gonna say that equivariant spectrum is type N comma K if, so the first number will indicate the underlying type. So if the underlying type is N and the geometric fixed points is type K. Okay. Um, and so again, we're then gonna use this equivariant notion to then define a notion of type for um, our, our motivic spectra as well. So if we have an R motivic spectrum, we get its type by first realizing it into the equivariant category and then asking for its type there. That's, so that's the definition we're gonna work with. Okay, um, so let's then look at some examples. Hey, Bert, I, yeah. I have a question and yeah. I'm probably sort of showing my ignorance about sure. equivariant, my, of equivariant homotopy theory. So yeah. are Balmer and San Sanders, they're saying that the thick subcategories are kind of determined, are, are they exactly the N type N comma K? Well, it's, I mean, these are the this thick subcategories. Um, Th those are the thick subcategories. Yeah. Okay, and then you could, So, okay. you know, so this is, we're sort of intersecting two different types, right? Um, right. We're saying that, you know, you're in U inverse CN and you're in phi inverse CK. So you're intersecting two of those. Okay, so it's two singly graded families, not a bi-graded families of thick subcategories. Well, sorry, no, so, I mean, uh, no, 
Uh, yeah, I, I think I think that that's right. You have these two families. That's right. Okay. And, and there are some containments. Um, right. Right. So this is saying a containment, for instance. Okay. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so let's look at some examples. Um, so that again, a sort of so, uh, you know simple example, the equivariant sphere. Uh, well, this is going to be type zero, zero. So both the underlying and the fixed points are just the sphere. Um, uh, and so each example, I'm going to tell you the equivariant. And then, of course, by definition, this is going to tell you the equivariant type, uh, the motivic type, right? Each of the examples I'm going to give will, in fact, be the Betty realization of an R motivic spectrum. Okay, so automatically we get the type of the motivic spectrum. Um, okay, perhaps more interesting is, is the sphere mod two, although again, that's not terribly interesting. I mean, both the underlying and the fixed points are the more spectrum, and so this is type one one. Okay, so nothing terribly exciting yet. Um, but in some sense, two is not the right thing to think about. Um, so, you know, classically two, you know, we saw this already for the more spectrum, two is that hop invariant one element. Um, and so we have that simple A module structure. Um, now it turns out not to be the case motivically or equivariantly. There is a different element which plays the role of that half element. Uh, so that element is called H here. Uh, the, the name H comes from the fact that it can be thought of as the hyperbolic plane um, uh, or hyperbolic uh, form. Um, and so this is the, the correct sort of first uh, motivic Hopf invariant one element. Um, and there's different ways to, to think about this. Um, if you look at the Betty realization, it turns out that this is two minus A times eta. So A is, is um, in the motivic context, this is known as rho, which is gonna come up in a bit. Um, so this is the Euler class of the sine representation. Uh, if you prefer to think of pi naught of, of the sphere as the Burnside ring, uh, then this corresponds to the free orbit C2. Uh, but at any rate, th this turns out to be the correct Hopf invariant one element. Um, and so if you take this uh, cofiber of H, the underlying is the cofiber of two, that's a, you know, the Morse spectrum, but the uh, under fixed points, H goes to zero. And so when you take fixed points, you just get a zero wedge S1. Well, that's type zero. So here we have one of the examples where the fixed point did indeed uh, drop the height by one or the type by one. Okay. All right, um, just a few more examples. Um, so you could do S mod eta. Uh, and again, the underlying will be, well, S mod eta classically. Um, and the fixed points, well, the fixed points of eta turn out to be two. Um, well, depending on how you set things up, it could be plus or minus two, but let's not worry about that. Um, and so the, uh, the fixed points will be type one. So then now we have a complex of type zero comma one in our terminology. Um, but what I really care about are these complexes Y. Um, and so let's think about that next. And because we have sort of two different motivic lifts of two, well, remember that Y was gotten by coning off two and eta. Uh, well, now we're going to get two different notions of, of a motivic version of Y. So first we can think of, of coning off two and eta motivically. And, and so, okay, the underlying will just be our Y, right? Um, if we take fixed points, okay, two goes to two, but eta also goes to two. And so we're sort of coning off two twice. And, and so we get M smash M for our fixed points. Um, both of these are type one. So this is a type one comma one uh, spectrum. Um, we can also think about coning off H and eta instead, right? H is, is it really our preferred element rather than two. Um, the underlying type is still the same, uh, but the fixed points are now a little bit different. I mean, notationally, it looks similar. On the one case, before we had a smash, now it turns out we get a, a wedge. Uh, and again, this is um, because H goes to zero under fixed points. So now we get a, a wedge of two more spectra. Um, it's still type one one, okay? just as the previous one was but the fixed points are certainly different. Okay. Um, okay, so let's start to talk about self maps. Um, and so let's start with the, the motivic lifts of S mod two of the Morse spectrum. Um, and so, you know, so we have the S mod two, as I said before, that's not really super interesting, right? I mean, you, you can, I mean, this, we've sort of taken the classical Morse spectrum and sort of pushed it into the motivic category. Uh, if you prefer to think equivariantly, we've taken the classical Morse spectrum and just thinking of this as equivariant with a trivial action. So um, we had our classical view under the fourth self map and, and that sort of goes into this category as well. So I'm not gonna spend too much more time talking about that. 
But what's more interesting is S mod H. Okay, and remember we said this is a type zero uh, complex. Um, and here there's different kind of self maps that we could ask, we could look for, right? So, so here I say type V1 nil. And what do I mean by that? Well, on the underlying spectrum, I'm getting a V1 map, but on the fixed points, I'm getting a nil potent map. Okay, so it's not a periodic map. Um, we could also ask for a, a, a map that's nil potent on the underlying, but type zero on the fixed points, uh, or we can ask something that's periodic both at the underlying and fixed point level. Okay. And let's see. So, well, it turns out you can't have any of the first type. And that actually follows from that Balmer Sanders result I mentioned before, right? Suppose you had such a, a thing, then the cofiber. So at the level underlying, you'd be the cofiber is going to have higher height. So it's going to have type two at the at the uh, underlying. But the fixed points we're taking cofiber with the null potent map. The, the fixed points will not jump or not increase in, in in type. And so the cofiber of such a map would be type two comma zero, but that cannot occur. Okay, so we can't have such a map. Um, the next type. Well, it turns out yes, uh, eta is a, a type. Um, nil comma zero, right? So, you know, underlying nil, uh, eta is a nil potent map. The level of fixed points, it gives you a two, which is a, a type, you know, which, which is a, a V zero self map. Um, and then V one zero, actually it turns out that you don't have such a thing. So this is one of the things we show in our paper. Um, that's not what I wanna focus on for the talk today, but uh, we do have that, that computation in our paper. Okay. Um, what I want to focus on more instead are these complexes Y, okay? And so again, as I said before, that we have these two different, um, you know, motivic versions of, of Y, one where we're coding off two and eta, and the other one where we're coding off H and eta. And so again, you know, this type one, one, and, and, you know, in theory, we have these three different types of, of self maps, right? But where it's either periodic on the underlying or fixed points, or perhaps both. Um, and so, well, it turns out that we do have a V1 nil. And so this is one of the things we show uh, in, in our paper. Uh, so you know, I, I said our paper uh, several times, we, we, we posted a, a, an article about this back uh, in August. That's what I'm referring to. Um, as I, actually, I think technically speaking, this one is not in, in our paper. Um, the one we showed in our paper was the, you know, was this one, uh, but it turns out uh, basically the same argument works to, to give you this one as well. Um, but we don't really know about the others. So it's you know, not, a, not a complete story by any means. Um, but so what I want to sort of focus is, is telling you about this map. Okay. And so in order to do that, we need to talk about A module, right? If you remember back to our, our, our story from before, um, you know, A module structures were definitely used as tools to, to produce this map. Okay, so now I, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, different A-module structures. And the, the first thing we need to talk about is the cohomology of a point, which again, classically, is not much to say when, we're, when our cohomology theory is eilenberg maclean But it turns out in the motivic context, uh, especially in the R-motivic context, this is more interesting. Okay, so here's a notation for the cohomology of a point, M2, M for motivic. Um, and according to Vyvodsky, this is a polynomial algebra on two generators, tau and rho. Okay, so we have tau here and rho here. And so this is a, a cone. Okay. Um, and this is one of the spots where thinking R motivically is easier than equivalently. Equivalently, there's also a sort of dual negative cone, uh, but we're not going to work with that today. We're working with the easier motivic situation. Now, what I've drawn into this picture um, is uh, not just the, the, the cohomology groups. But I've also, you know, it turns out that there is a non-trivial uh, action of the motivic Steenrod algebra on the cohomology of a point. Uh, and so again, the motivic Steenrod algebra is, you know, has generators square one, square two, square four, et cetera. And I'm using the same convention I used before. So a square one uh, is a black straight line. So now, I'm, you know, before it's vertical, now it's horizontal. So I apologize for that. Uh, but these black lines um, are a square one. Um, the blue lines are square two, and so they go to the right by two, but they also increase the so-called weight by one. Okay, and, and so this is, um, yeah, this is what's happening here with the, the square twos. 
Um, so, you know, so tau squared supports a square two, for instance. Uh, and then there's also a, a curved red line, and that's a square four. So it turns out that tau cubed supports a square four. Um, okay, and then as you go up, the higher powers of two are, are, are uh, higher powers of tau, excuse me, um, can potentially support higher and higher squares. Okay, so it's it, it's you know highly non-trivial. Okay, and so this is sort of our you know our building block for uh, for our A modules. Okay, so let's um, let's look at some other examples. Um, so maybe the next thing to do is think about our motivic analogs of the Mohr spectrum. Okay, and so first what I've drawn here is just the, the cohomology itself without the A module structure. Uh, and so you can see that, you know, we have these two cones, a, a black cone and an orange cone, um, and right, that's giving us our, our cohomology. That's just the direct sum of those two. Um, and then we can ask about, well, what is the A module structure? And so, you know, if we think about sort of classically, we do expect um, to get a square one connecting them like so, okay? Um, but, you know, remember we, there was also sort of square ones um, up above on the higher tau multiples, et cetera. And so that's gonna propagate and using the Cartan formula, you're gonna get, um, well, some information, uh, higher information. The other thing you might notice is that here, there's one more interesting possibility, right? Namely, there's a possibility for a square two on, on that zero cell. Classically, this doesn't happen, but here there is room for that, okay? And it turns out that is a valid A module structure. Um, and well, now I have two spectra and I've just told you about two possible A module structures and well, it turns out that those are the two answers. So there are two possible A module structures on this if, if we suppose that square one at the bottom and it turns out that both of these are realized and they're realized by these two particular spectra two particular motivic spectra. Um, and uh, right, so again, you know, the, if we take the cofiber of H, this does not have this square two. And so, so again, this is the, for, you know, this is corresponding to the fact that this is the Hopf invariant one element. We just have the square one. We don't have this other noise of the square two or this other sort of error term, if you like. Um, so this is, this is sort of the, the simpler structure. But here I have sort of propagated the, the higher square ones and square twos. Um, so again, it gets a little bit complicated, um, but that's, that's what we have. Okay, so those are our uh, more spectra. Uh, and then we also wanna think about um, why. Um, and so again, we have these two different versions of why, and here they are on the left, um, you know, written in, in, you know, as the, just the, the cohomology itself without the A module structure. Uh, and I apologize for those of you that are chromatically challenged as I am, uh, but hopefully for some of you will appreciate the differences in colors and, and find that useful. I have tried to color code uh, the pictures on the left and the pictures on the right. So we have a cell in degrees zero, one, two, and three, um, and they turn out to have uh, different weights, right? That's the vertical direction. Um, now, you know, these spectra were defined actually as smash products. And so you can use the Cunith formula to determine the A module structure. Um, and, you know, if you look at this, you know, so, so again, what we sort of expect is, um, you know, the square one and square two structure like so. Um, but again, you notice just by staring at the picture that there's possibility for something new to happen, right? So even if we have agreed on, on the A of one structure, that means we've agreed on what square zero and square one are doing, turns out that there's a possible square four that might occur here, right? If you look, starting from the zero cell, if you go over four and up two, hey, there's a class there. Uh, so algebraically, you could have a square four. Um, and sure enough, it turns out that that is a valid A module structure. Uh, and it turns out that that's what you get from this Y, uh, the one with, using two. Um, so again, I've, I've written a row here. So square four in the bottom cell is hitting row times the three cell. Okay. Whereas if you use the, the Hopf invariant one element, you don't get that square four there. And again, this is just a calculation from the Cartan formula coming from the, our previous A modules. Okay. Um, so again, you, you have this square four. Uh, it turns out that there's no higher possibilities and so that's, that's what we get to. Uh, we just get these two uh, A module structures. Um, all right. Uh, so remember classically, we had this algebraic extension of A modules where in the middle we had A1 and then we had these two B ones on the side. Um, and so let's think about what happens motivically here as well. Um, so first of all, there, there's one new phenomenon, right? You see I've written a tau here. Um, 
And that's coming from, so remember I, I wrote down the, um, the classical uh, Adam relation square two, square two equal to square one, square two, square one, right? Um, now that can't possibly be true motivically because if you remember the weight, so square two has weight one and square one has weight zero. And so the total weight on the left is two, whereas the total weight on the right is one. So those can't possibly be right. And you might say, well, okay, how could I possibly make this, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know uh, a formula that might make sense potentially? And well, we can just sort of throw in a tau on the right to at least get the weights to match up. Okay. And that turns out to be a correct formula. Okay, and so that's what this picture means here. I put in a tau to tell you, okay, square two on this class is hitting the tau multiple of the generator. Okay. Um, well, anyway, so it turns out that, you know, this classical extension that we had, we do have this motivic extension, at least at the level of, you know, the A of one structure. So if we're only thinking about square one and square two, okay? And then classically, I said, okay, you know, this middle guy has some square fours, but that doesn't really affect the story at all. Well, now we've seen motivically square fours do enter into the story because already at this level, we have two different choices of square fours, okay? Um, well, what about A of one? Right? We need to think about how many different choices of, of square four structures are there there. Um, and the answer is a lot. Uh, so, you know, here is A of one. Um, and I, I've, I've drawn the picture in a kind of a funny way. So, so first of all, there's the underlying, um, you know, cohomology, the M2 module. So we have eight different cones here, right? One, um, another one, and then Z and U and W and then three more that I did not give names to. So there's eight cones here that you can see. Uh, and you can see the picture is pretty cluttered. Um, and then what I've, uh, what I've done is I've just labeled the square one and square two only on the generators, okay? Of course, as we saw before in the, the case of the you know, Y and the Morse spectra, they propagate upwards and there's a lot of, uh, of high operations happening up here. I just haven't drawn those in because, well, the picture is already cluttered enough. But uh, so this is a potentially misleading picture, but. Nevertheless, I just wanted to indicate what can happen, what happens on the, you know, just on the generators. So again here, um, yeah, and, and let me sort of draw the, the corresponding picture. Uh, that we had before. Okay, and so again, we have that that tau. And again, you can see that in this picture, right? If you do, if you start with a square two on X, uh, you go to Z, and then another square two goes up here, and that's the tau multiple of one, two, one, okay? So that's, again, what, what this tau here is telling you. Okay, um, so now I wanna think about, first, I'm just gonna talk about A of two module structures. And so again, what does that mean? I just wanna think about what kind of square fours could we get, okay? And you know, you're gonna look at this result and say 64, oh, okay, that's a power of two, I know what's happening, right? There's, uh, you know, just some, some choices and that's two to the sixth, right? And, and so, okay, pretty, pretty simple. Um, turns out it's not, um, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so I just wanna give you a little bit of indication of what happens here. So again, we wanna think about the possible square fours. Um, so remember classically, you know, there was just, uh, the zero cell, the one cell, and the two cell that could possibly emit a square four. Um, well, here also these classes that I've written as V and W, there is room for a square four, right? So for instance, I look at W, so square four goes to the right four and up two. This is in three comma one. So now, now we wanna see, is there a class in seven comma three? And sure enough, there is, okay? And so both V and W could potentially emit um, a square four. Okay, so that's, that's some new information we didn't have classically. Now each of those, there's you know, there's just one possible target. So that's you know, I guess already that's sort of potentially giving us four different choices depending on whether V or W admit square fours. Um, let's see. And classically, you know, that that class Y, we knew by the Adam relations, it necessarily supported the square four. Um, and so here, the target of the square four is there. Okay. Now there are two dots there. Um, you know, one the the sort of the, the gray dot is sort of the one we're used to classically. And then the other one is a row multiple. And so that's something we don't see classically. Um, so again, the Adem relation is gonna give us some information so that we know that that um, gray dot must sort of be, uh, you know, that the square four must sort of hit that gray dot, 
but it can also hit that, that, that row multiple as well. So we do get sort of two choices of square four and y. Um, okay. Um, what else? Well, if we look at x, where does the square four and x go? It goes right here. We see three dots there. Okay. And one of them is sort of a tau multiple of this class, but then the other two are the row multiples of v and w. And again, the row multiples are something we don't see classically. And so there's just a lot more choice here. Uh, and similarly, z, uh, this is in two comma one, it's gonna go to six comma three. Again, there's three choices. Um, if you look at all those choices, um, that was way more than six, okay? And so, um, so it's not just a matter of, okay, do those, you know, just take those choices and how many do you get? Um, as you would expect, the ADEM relations do have something to say. Uh, and so there are a lot of uh, interrelations between these choices. And so you do have to do some careful counting here. Um, and our count came up with 64. Um, okay, so, so again, th these are just A of two, uh, but then the story's not done um, because what about square eight? Turns out there's a possible square eight, right? If you look at X, square eight goes over eight and up four. Oh, hey, we have a dot there. Uh, and again, uh, so that's another choice we can make. Now, so, so here going from 64 to 128 is just multiplication by two. It's only the question of whether that square eight exists or not. That, that's all. So that step is, is simple, uh, but this is, is much more uh, intricate bookkeeping. Okay, so it turns out we have a lot of different choices for our A module structure on A of one. If we go back to the story of extension, so at the algebraic level, um, it turns out that um, you know, some of our choices of A module will give us uh, an, ex an algebraic extension uh, with this version of B of one. And some of the choices of A module will give us an algebraic extension with this other choice of B1, right? So one of them, remember this one did not have the square four and this one did. Uh, in any case, we, we get, um, you know, we do get these two different, um, well, we get many uh, algebraic extensions. And so these give rise to elements of X. Um, and then again, you, you have to, you know, do an Adams spectral sequence argument to see that actually these elements survive the spectral sequence and therefore give rise to, um, to self maps, okay, of these two different versions of Y. Okay, um, so um, yes, so again, the, the first bar is just saying, okay, there's no possible targets, right? And so, um, you know, you can do this using a, a lot of computations of Duggar Isaacson and, and Belmont Isaacson, um, just to see the appropriate groups uh, vanish. And then to say that it's a V1 nil self map, well, you know, from the construction, it's pretty clear that it restricts to the appropriate V1 map we had underlying. And so that's the, the first part of the V1 common nil. Um, and then the nil potent part is, is pretty uh, simple as well, it turns out. I mean, if you look at the, the fixed points, so for instance, the, the one based on H, remember I told you the fixed points before were uh, a wedge of more spectra. Um, and then because of the nature of the V1 self map that we've produced, um, you know, so I didn't write this down. Um, maybe, let me just write this quickly that, um, you know, the, the map we produce is from two comma one y um, to y. Okay, and so the point I want to emphasize right now is that there's this two comma one and that weight is an important part of the information. Uh, and because of that, that weight there, it tells you that the map on fixed points is from a one fold suspension. Okay, and so map from a one fold suspension is not gonna be a V1 self map. Uh, remember, V1 is in degree two. And so similarly, uh, for the other version of Y, uh, we don't get a self map. Um, okay, so that's, that's a sort of rough sketch of, of that argument. Um, and then just the, the, the last thing I wanna say in the last minute here. Um, so, okay, so right, so, so the cofiber then, as we said before, is, is a type two one, right? We've, uh, we increase the, the type of the underlying spectrum, but not of the fixed points. Uh, and then necessarily the cofiber is of type 2, 1. And so these are uh, sort of two realizations of A of 1. Uh, and so the, you know, this sort of connects them with the question of, well, uh, you know, of realizing A modules, right? Which is an interesting question of its own. And so my last slide here is just, uh, um, just a, a quick sketch of, of one way that, that we sort of concretely realize some A modules. So that's not necessarily needed for the discussion before, but it's uh, interesting. Um, and um, so what you do is you start with this question mark complex. So you, you, uh, you know, take a cofiber of H and then attach an eta. And so by the way, this is possible because of this 
relation in uh, motivic stable homotopy groups. Uh, and so, right, so there's this method of, of Jeff Smith of producing these A modules using idempotence and group rings. Uh, and basically, the, the answer is that that method uh, does work in this context. So you take some idempotent in the group ring sigma three, uh, and you, you apply that idempotent on the third smash power of this question mark complex. Uh, and it turns out if you do that, uh, it gives you a, a particular uh, realization of A1. It's this one. So we have, uh, it turns out we have two square fours and we don't have this square eight. And, and uh, you know, so again, this square four is heading a tau multiple. Uh, this one is, is, um, is, is not. Um, and so the last thing I'll say is that, um, in fact, all of the A modules can be realized. Now we don't have explicit constructions of all of them. We have explicitly constructed a handful of them. I think actually just two at this point, um, but there's no another way to realize these. Um, namely, you can use some obstruction theory due to TOTA and, and compute some X groups and show that, well, the X groups where the obstructions lie uh, all vanish. And so therefore, um, just from that standpoint, uh, you, you, know, you know that these modules can be realized. And the question of realizing them explicitly uh, is more difficult. Okay, well, so that's where uh, I will end. So thanks for your attention.